This full-length version of the Tommy Angelo episode has been available for patrons for a full year now, but if you want to see the episode on Vito Scaletta right now, you can sign up yourself and start watching it right after catching up on this one. You're listening to WBDS, Behringer's Radio. America, the land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangsters, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on A Criminal History, A Mafia Story. Yes, folks, that's right. Tonight, in collaboration with our sponsors over at Swift Cola, WBDS Behringer's Radio brings you a chilling story about the plague of crime that had seemingly overrun our wonderful city in the 1930s, with a closer look at one of Lost Heaven's most notorious organized crime outfits. Thanks to the insights of our investigative reporters at the Lost Heaven Courier and details obtained from the LHPD's own Detective John Norman, we are proud to bring you this tale of opportunity, family, and cold-blooded murder as we examine the criminal history of Thomas Angelo. Look, police at his ceiling. He's the guy we want in a tussle, but he's not smart enough to run anything. Sam is loyal, but he has no vision. But you, Tommy, you could run this town someday. This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I can't fully express my gratitude for. Thank you all so much. And this episode is brought to you in part by my executive producers, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story-based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story-based games to come. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything, from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch, and Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Every little bit helps, people. Even if you can't support me financially, though, support the show by showing my executive producers some love. And without further ado, enjoy today's video. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the program. If you're a regular listener of WBDS and happen to own a television set, you can now tune in to our full video broadcast of tonight's program on Channel 3 to learn all about the City of Lost Heaven's criminal history. Like so many stories relating to the organized crime outfits across the city in the 1930s, our story tonight begins not in Lost Heaven itself, but in the rolling hills of the Italian countryside, and more specifically, the town of San Celeste on the island of Sicily. As many of our listeners likely already know, a deluge of criminal organizations originally based in parts of Italy made their jump to American territory in the early parts of the 20th century, with a significant majority of those organizations originally hailing from the otherwise isolated island just off the Italian coast. In San Celeste on April the 5th, 1900, tonight's subject was born Thomas Angelo, to Marco Angelo Sr. and Maria Angelo, as the third and youngest child of three, with an older brother, Marco Jr., and an older sister, Isabella. Tommy's father, Marco Sr., worked as a supervisor at the Valari Lemon Grove Plantation near the port of Messina, and for a time, kept the family living in relative comfort, until the plantation was foreclosed by a moneylender, forcing the Angelo family to reevaluate their options, if they wanted to survive. 
It also seems likely that Marco Sr. not only worked at the plantation, but also lived on the premises with his family, as by the time of foreclosure, the family would be evicted from their home, and soon after, in 1904, emigrate to the United States, in hopes of finding new opportunities in America. The family would spend nearly a month at sea aboard the Maritimo Italiano, as they prepared to face the newest chapter of their lives, and by Christmas Day of 1904, arrived in Empire Bay, New York, eventually making their way to the city of Lost Heaven, Illinois, on a crowded train, where they settled down permanently. Tommy's father would find new employment as a dock worker at the Lost Heaven Harbor, and continue to provide for his family until his death 15 years later, in either 1919 or 1920. Tommy would spend a majority of his youth still living with his family, and eventually, at around the age of 20, decide to temporarily leave Lost Heaven in search of regular employment, which he would find as a member of a road crew, helping to build the rapidly sprawling highway networks which had begun to spring up all across the nation with the rise of the automobile. All across the northern United States, Tommy would work to help bring the government's vision of a nationwide road network to life, living in nomadic-style camps as each new stretch of highway was completed, and building up considerable savings in the process. By 1926, Tommy would become weary of the heavy labor required to keep building new stretches of highway, and decide to move back to Lost Heaven, using the money he'd managed to save up to purchase a Schubert 6 taxicab, and begin working as a cabbie, just as the imminent curtain of the Depression loomed closer with each passing day. For several years, Tommy would learn the ins and outs of taxi driving around the city of Lost Heaven, becoming a skilled driver by catering to his customers' often self-serving demands, as clientele from his own social class whittled away, leaving him serving mostly the slightly more affluent denizens of the city who could afford to spend the money needed to get around, without owning a car of their own. Eventually, though, Lost Heaven, like most places in America, would experience what has become known as the Great Depression, and work for nearly all lower-income Americans would seem to drop off at a frightening speed. Luckily for Tommy, even in the midst of economic ruin, the more affluent citizens of the city would still have a need for taxi drivers, and Tommy's profession would be one of the few that seemed almost immune to the downturn prevalent in so many other places, although not without cost. Tommy would be forced to work long hours, seemingly every day, in order to continue making ends meet, and settled into mostly working night shifts in order to have more time with his own thoughts. But even with his nose to the grindstone, it would be next to impossible to do anything more than simply carry on, no longer able to build up any real savings, despite his regular, grueling work schedule. However, while many immigrants like Tommy would manage to find some form of honest work in the wake of the Depression, many others had instead taken to a life of crime in order to make ends meet, and especially those who hailed from Tommy's home island of Sicily. By 1930, as organized crime rackets grew even more powerful with the Depression raging on, and even more so with the City of Lost Heaven being voted a dry county during alcohol prohibition, Tommy would eventually find himself in the wrong place at the wrong time, when working his regular night shift as a cabbie, and being accosted by a pair of thugs in the midst of an automobile shootout, who promptly threatened Angelo into driving for them to escape a group of similarly violent criminals working for a rival crime family. I mostly drove nights, because the money was better. It was at the end of one of those shifts, when I first met Polly and Sam. Shit! Anywhere. Fast. 
Already being a talented driver thanks to his many years of moving people around the city and avoiding the Lost Heaven police when possible to earn extra tips, Tommy would successfully manage to evade the pursuers and deliver the two men to a bar in Little Italy, Salieri's, where he was compensated for his efforts in saving the two high-ranking members of the Salieri crime family. What Tommy didn't know at the time was just how deep this relatively simple act of skillful driving would drag him into the world of organized crime, and just how tempting the money they made in comparison to the average shows on the street would be. Pull over in front of that bar. To the Aries place. Yeah, that's the one. Wait here. What for? You want a little something from the Don or not? Compensation for your services, any damage to your car. This makes us square. I'm sure it's more than enough. Good. Don Silieri wants you to know that he's very grateful. So if you ever need anything, maybe a loan, or some honest work, don't hesitate to ask. Don doesn't forget his friends. Yeah, okay, thanks. One more thing. This matter stays between us. Anyone asks where you got that money, you want it at poker. The scratches on your car, you swerved to keep from hitting a little old lady. You got it? No, of course. See you around, kid. Envelope. I could have had a heart attack. Enough to fix the cap. <laughs> Nearly enough to buy a new one. I thought about what Sam said about work. I wasn't interested. The money was good, sure, but I didn't want to get in with criminals. Better to be poor and alive than rich and dead. So, right there, back then, I was out. As it turned out, the two men Tommy had helped were Salieri Capo Regime's Sam Trapani and Polly Lombardo, and having been thoroughly impressed with Tommy's skills as a driver, they would even offer him an opportunity to work for the Salieri crew to make some extra money. But, at least at the time, Tommy would be less than interested in going from cabbie to gangster, or even being directly associated with the crew at all if it meant risking his life. Unfortunately, even if his initial decision to help Sam and Polly had been made under duress, the rival outfit to the Salieri crew would be less than pleased with Tommy's intervention, and soon after getting his cab fixed and returning to work, Tommy would once again find himself the target of angry, violent monsters. Whoa, Jesus! Oh. Hey, how you doing, pal? You remember me? Uh. Yeah? Uh. Huh? <clears throat> Mr. Morello's a little bent. Shouldn't go helping Salieri's goons, huh? I'm gonna have to give you a beating. Just so you always remember who runs this town. Make it so you won't do much rocking for a while, eh? <laughs> Look at this guy. I didn't think he'd make it fun. Let's get him. He would flee the attackers through much of Little Italy, luckily being just agile enough to avoid being caught 
and by either sheer coincidence or divine providence, wind up right back at Salieri's bar where he promptly took cover from his pursuers of the Morello crime family, Dino and Lou, at just the right time. Look at this. How you doing, kid? Dino, Lou, you got business with the Don? Nah, we just trying to talk to that cabbie over there, that's all. That right. Yeah. Well, this here's the Don's favorite driver. So anything you got to say to him, you can say to me. Is that right? Well, I'll tell you something, pal, we ain't leaving empty-handed, that's for sure. Well, then maybe you ain't leaving at all. Okay, then. See your boys around. Let's go, Lou. <laughs> hey, thanks. At least we could do. Come on. Let's go say hi to the Don. Don Salieri? Yeah. He's going to want to hear about this. At the behest of Sam and Polly, Tommy would meet with Salieri accountant Frank Coletti, and later the Don himself, this time having a personal stake in the attack on his livelihood, and pleading with Don Ennio Salieri to give him permission to take revenge on the Morello thugs who had once again put his business in danger. While it may not have been official quite yet, it was at this moment, arguably, that Thomas Angelo became a gangster of Lost Heaven. What do they call you, son? Thomas. Thomas Angelo, sir. Frank told me you ran into some trouble? Yes, sir. My cab got smashed up pretty good. Morello's thugs went after him by the kind of Tommy helping us. This, uh, taxi, that's your livelihood? Yes, sir. I feel a sense of responsibility here. So I'm gonna set you up with a small loan, enough to get that cab of yours fixed up. I appreciate that, sir, but I'm not looking for a handout. Then what are we doing here? I just want a shot at the bastards who wrecked my cab. <laughs> you hear that, Frank? The kid wants my permission to get into a fight. Yes, I heard. Okay, Tommy Angelo. All the Morellas grills hang out at a bar he owns. Paul, you know the place. Sure do, boss. Good. You can ride along with Tommy. There's a lot right next to the bar where they park their cars. Go smash up a few tin cans, send Morello a message. He can't rough up hard-working Joes in my neighborhood without getting a black eye. Thank you, Mr. Salieri. I won't let you down. And Tommy, when you get back, we'll talk about what's next for you. With permission from the Don himself, Tommy would accompany Polly to the lounge bar owned by Marcu Morello of the rival Morello crime family in North Park after meeting several other members of the Salieri crew, including weapons expert Vincenzo Ricci and natural mechanic Ralphie. Armed with only a couple of baseball bats and several homemade firebomb grenades, Tommy and Polly would sneak their way onto the premises and proceed to destroy numerous vehicles owned by Morello's goons, before stealing one owned by one of the thugs who had roughed up Tommy's cab, Dino, and returning to Salieri's with news of their success. Hey boss, it's done. No trouble? Yeah, nothing we couldn't handle, Mr. Salieri. Good, good, sit down. You see Morello? Nah. But he'll be plenty pissed when his boys tell him what happened. <laughs> He's not going to be able to think straight for weeks. See, that's the difference between me and Morello. I'm a businessman. I do everything with this. Every decision I make, it's what's good for the business and my boys. But Morello, 
He's a hothead. And all that anger burns out the brain. And when he gets mad, he gets stupid. You got nothing like that to worry about with Tommy here. He was aces the whole way, boss. I'm glad to hear it. I got a growing business here. We could use a guy like you to help out around the bar. Maybe run some errands. Make sure the bills get paid on time. You up for that? Oh, it'd be an honor, sir. Good. Good. Now, Polly and Sam have already vouched for you. But you need to understand we have a few rules around here, so you listen and listen good. First, no cursing on the premises. There's a million words out there. And the man who needs to resort to fuck this and fuck that is just ignorant or lazy. Second, we don't deal in the hard stuff. I don't want any dope fiends in this neighborhood. We'll let Morella poison his own people if that's what he wants. Finally, stay out of trouble with the cops. We only have a few on the payroll. And if you cross the line, the rest will come after you. You understand? Yes, Mr. Salieri. Then I'm gonna only ask you for one more thing, Tommy. I don't keep Paulie and Sam around just because they're strong. A lot of guys out there bigger and tougher than these two. And I don't keep Frank on apparel because he's smart. Though he is an artist with the numbers. All these guys in this room, they're here because they have the only thing that matters to me. The only thing that should matter to any of us. You know what that is, Tommy? They're loyal. That's right. Now, you stay straight with me, you're gonna be living the high life, Tom. But you abuse my trust. <sighs> Don Salieri, you won't ever need to worry about me. Okay, then. Welcome to the family. Excellent. Now I'm starving. Luigi, let's eat. Welcome. A barman Luigi is not much of a cook. But his daughter, Sarah, Maron. Though originally uninterested in becoming a full-fledged gangster, now spurred on by his desires for revenge and his need to keep the lights on during a particularly rough economic time, Tommy Angelo would officially join Salieri's crew and begin working his way up the ranks using his many natural talents for criminal handiwork. Having already been vouched for by Sam and Polly, Tommy would be able to skip a certain amount of the usual legwork necessary to develop a reputation with the family, by accompanying the two on their many regular routines collecting earnings from the organization's various protection rackets, among others. And it's collection day, boys. So Tommy, you'll drive, Polly and Sam can handle the rest. It'll be routine. Just a handful of stops today. Bill at the motel was a little short last month. So make sure he pays us the interest he owes. No problem, boss. Don't lay hands on anyone unless there's no other choice. Our clients need to understand that we provide a valuable service. They need to look at you and see Santa Michael. They need to believe you'll protect them. So let Morella stoop to breaking legs. We're better than that. But the bills still do, and everyone pays up. We can handle it. Go see Ralphie about a car. Okay, boss. After several normal collections around the city, the group would pay a visit to the Clark's Motel just outside of town, and Tommy would be given his first real opportunity to prove himself as not just a driver, but a full-blooded button man for the Salieri crew, when Sam and Polly are ambushed by Morello's soldiers, already present at the motel, shooting Polly non-fatally, and taking Sam hostage in an effort to interrogate useful information out of him, in addition to keeping Salieri's expected payment for themselves. Christ, Polly! Tell Salieri from here on out this place is ours. Capish? And don't come back, or you'll end up in worse shape than your friends. Denzel, 
They're trying to beat information out of them. I gotta get you to a doctor. Uh, uh, that can wait. Get Sam out of there. Okay. Okay, just hang on. Though not a war veteran or even particularly familiar with firearms at all, Tommy would demonstrate his natural aptitude with weapons by taking down several of the rival gangsters inside and eventually rescuing Sam from a back room, but with one of the Morello thugs fleeing the motel still holding the money. Tommy would once again be forced to use his abilities as a wheelman to catch and stop the thieves dead in their tracks. Though he'd started out as a simple driver meant to help Sam and Polly, it seemed Tommy was already proving just how valuable an asset he could really be to the family. Sam, they really went to work on you, buddy. Christ. Come on, you'll be all right. You're tough as nails. He's got the money, Tom! Oh, catch the bastard! <laughs> that was when I saw the cost. What it meant to be on the inside. Huh. I should have took off there and then. But I couldn't go back to being a nobody. By 1932, Tommy Angelo had become a regular and dependable earner for the Salieri crime family, and had even earned the trust of Don Salieri himself, which only pushed him further along the path of criminal debauchery that he'd already chosen for himself. When Don Salieri's personal investment in a local racer, Mikey Dunn, threatens to turn sour with a new European racer in town, the Don would entrust Tommy with the job of making sure that Mikey emerged the victor, no matter what had to be done. Tommy. Thanks for getting down here so quickly. Yeah, sure thing, boss. What do you need? You know, there's a race coming up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Polly and Sam have some money on uh, the local. Mikey Dunn. That's the guy. He's a good kid, but a bit of a scrapper. Not too smart with his money. A few years ago, Mikey comes to me asking for a loan. He wants to get new tires so he can keep racing junkers out at the quarry. Mm. I like fast cars. I figured it'll be a bit of a hobby. Turns out, <laughs> Mikey's a great investment. The kid can't lose a race if he walks the track. He graduates from the Junkers to Gow jobs, and I start placing a few bets on him here and there. Next thing I know, I've made all my money back and more. Hey, uh, Sam says he's the guy to beat. He was. We ran all the competition out of town. But now Ralph says there's a hotshot European entering the race, and he's got a car faster than our boys by a country mile. How much do we stand to lose? A truckload, but not just our outfit. A lot of guys from the neighborhood come to me for financial advice. They've all put money down on this kid. It'll be like Black Thursday around here if he loses. Well, for everyone except Morello. Oh, you think he's from the European? Oh, I'm certain of it. You want something to happen to the driver? Can't find him. Morello's got him holed up somewhere safe. Besides, if he drops out or disappears now, none of our wagers will stand. Everyone will cry foul, say the race is fixed. What about his car? That's the ticket, Tommy. Ralph knows a guard at the track. You go down there tonight, you boost the European's car, bring it to one of our mechanics, and make a few adjustments, you bring the car back. Should be no problem, boss. But even after taking the European's car to be purposefully fiddled with by mechanic Lucas Bertoni, it would seem that Don Morello, who was betting against Dunn, would still be one step ahead. When Morello goons managed to find Mikey Dunn, they would badly injure him in order to stack the deck in their boss's favor. And as a result, Tommy Angelo would be asked to take Mikey's place, being the only other wheelman in Salieri's crew whose own skills could even approach those of Dunn. So Sam walks out of the bathroom, and I'm praying he's got a piece on him, because I'm not sure the bartender's going to hand over what he owes. And his two sons, they're inching closer. I can hear them cracking their knuckles. They're both seven feet tall, built like brick shit houses. What were you carrying? My dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. This crazy bastard, he waltzes out of the bathroom, just starts pissing all over the joint. <laughs> really? What, he didn't call the cops? Nah. Sometimes you just gotta make them think you're crazy. <laughs> Tom, you got the moments? Oh. Sure, Frank. 
We've got a bit of a situation. Is the boss okay? Oh, yeah, it's nothing like that. Mikey Dunn, our driver. Some of Morello's guys roughed him up pretty good last night. Broke his arm, broke his jaw. Sent him to the hospital. Jesus. Yeah, tough locker for Mikey. Anyway, you're going to race for him. Wait, what? Frank, Tom, I don't know. There's a half hour before the starting gun goes off, so this is not a discussion. The Don wants to win, but more importantly, he wants Morello to lose. And you are our best wheelman. Otherwise, I'd be talking to someone else. Yeah. Okay, Frank. Good. Rafi has the car gassed and ready. Get to the track right away. Against the odds, having never been in a race of this scale before, Tommy Angelo would indeed emerge victorious at the track, thanks in no small part to their sabotage of the Europeans' race car the night before, and Don Salieri would be more than pleased with Tommy. It would also be thanks to Tommy's participation in this race that he would first catch the attention of his future wife, Sarah Marino, and shortly after his victory that the two would begin to hit it off, so to speak, with the two likely already being at least passively familiar with each other due to Tommy's rising status in Salieri's crew and Sarah's position of helping her father Luigi at Salieri's bar in Little Italy, where Tommy hung out regularly. Tommy! There's <laughs> our winner! Hey, Tom. Just want to thank you for stepping in like you did. I had six months rent riding on that race. I'd be homeless now if not for you. I just did what the Don asked, Lucas. Well, you gotta let me find a way to repay you. Stop by my garage when you get a chance. I might have a line on something that'll turn a buck for you. Sure. Thanks. I knew you wouldn't let us down, Tom. You made us all a lot of money today. And Morello's gonna be picking up pennies off the sidewalk for weeks. <laughs> hey, what about the European? He's probably wearing cement boots by now, the poor bastard. <sighs> Here. You earned every dollar of this. Take your girl out somewhere nice. Thanks, boss. Up, boys. You got a girl, right? I don't want you blowing all that on booze and whores. Huh? Nah, but, uh... Maybe I'll buy my ma a new coat. <laughs> Good boy. Go get yourself a drink. Congratulations, big hero. Nah, I just got luckies off. Well, I had my money on the other guys, so... Drinks are on you. Oh. <laughs> there. Now you're ready for the pictures. Thanks. And hey, when you're done celebrating, you might want to go find your buddy, Polly. He's so drunk, he's gonna get hit by your parked car. Yeah, okay. I'll get him home safe. It would be some time after Tommy's win at the races in mid-November of 1932 that Luigi Marina would ask Tommy personally to walk Sarah home from Salieri's bar. Paranoid at a group of punks who had been harassing his daughter lately, including, though unbeknownst to Salieri's crew, Billy Galati son of city councilor, Roberto Galati. <sighs> yeah, that's the call, Tom. You want anything else? Nah, I'm heading home. Hey, Tom, uh, before you go, uh, I ask maybe a small favor, huh? Sure, Luigi, what do you need? Walk my daughter home. Sarah? <laughs> way I hear it, she doesn't need any kind of escort. <laughs> Uh, she's, uh, she's a tough. Uh, this is a pack of boys uh, near her place. Uh, the punks, you know, cattivi ragazzi. They talk blue, make advances. Sarah, she's gonna speak at the mind. But maybe she says something they don't like. Things get ugly. But if you working at home, this is a reminder of these punks, she's the dawn's a goddaughter. No problem, Luigi. I'd be honest. Benny. Sarah, time is to close. What's this then? 
Uh, Tom is, uh, Tom's gonna take you. That right. Hey, I just work here. Make sure nobody bother you. Fine. If it'll make you feel better, Pop. Hey. I'll see you tomorrow. Let me get my coat. I'll wait for you outside. Tommy, already being endeared to Luigi and interested in Sarah, would gladly agree, and the two would gradually begin to open up about their feelings for one another. After fighting off the goons hanging outside of Sarah's apartment, she would offer to clean his wounds, and the budding romance between them would slowly blossom as they empathized with each other. Oh! Hey there, darling! Are you stepping out on us? Piss off! <laughs> Don't cast the kitten, doll face! We'll let your boyfriend watch, what do you say? We going to have trouble here. Trouble started back when you tried to steal our girl, Chief. You saps aren't careful. You'll end up in wooden overcoats. <laughs> Last chance to walk away. We ain't frails. We know who you work for. Salieri might have been the big six when he was younger, but he's all washed up now. Mm -hmm. It's only a matter of time before Morello punches his ticket. <laughs> I don't need Salieri. Or anyone else. Not for this. <laughs> well... <laughs> Then let's see what you got, cake eater. Mm. Hey! <clears throat> you got a good right hook, I'll give you that. You're bleeding. Come up to my place, I'll take a look. Well, you gonna come in and take a load off, or what? I'm wondering when you'd invite me up. The bank's closed, Slugger. I'm just gonna patch you up, is all. Now go sit down on the couch, roll up your sleeve. I'm getting my sewing kit. Doesn't look too bad. You need something for the pain? No, I'm fine. You don't have to do that. What? I can see it fucking hurts, Tom. You want to pretend it? Don't go ask Polly to staple you up. What do you get? Compliments of the Dan. Take another. All right, you're gonna grin and bear this? Yeah, I'll be okay. Good. Cause I don't need the little old lady next door complaining to the super about all the racket. Just be quick about it, will ya? Oh, it's gonna take as long as it takes. The sloppier the stitch, the uglier the scar. They're right. You stitched up a lot of fellas. Just my father. Ma would really go after Luigi sometimes. He got pretty good at ducking dinner plates. So one day she stabbed him with her knitting needle. Right through the hand. What for? Because she was an ugly, jealous drunk. There. Not my best work, but it'll hold. The scar will be something to remember you by, if nothing else. <laughs> You're staying over. Can't have you stumbling through the neighborhood pie-eyed. Not when them hoods are out looking for you anyways. Yeah, okay. You got an extra blanket or something? No. And the heat's out. Although Tommy would manage to keep the punks away from Sarah that night, word of what happened would eventually reach Don Salieri, and, having known Sarah since she was just a little girl, he would be righteously furious. Wanting to set an example for the punks, Tommy would be ordered to find them and teach them an old-school mob lesson with a little help from Polly. 
This can't stand. Sarah's okay, boss. I took care of it. She started working here before she could see over the bar. I don't have a daughter of my own, Tom. I'd do anything for Luigi's little girl. So would I. We all would. That's right, boss. Anything for Luigi and Sarah. Do those bastards think this is fucking Luna Park or something? I'll rip them apart with my own hands. Our business is protection. But who's going to pay up when they learn we can't even protect one of our own as she walks home from work? So what do you want us to do? Teach these boys a lesson. Break every bone in their bodies. Put them in wheelchairs. Bust their faces up so bad even their mothers can't look at them without screaming. We know where they're holed up. My friend on the force says we should start looking into Chinatown. Then Big Biff will know something. Tommy. Go to Vinny, get us some gear. Meet me at Biff's place. Yeah, okay. Leave these punks laying in the street. I want everyone to know we do not allow mad dogs to run wild in our neighborhood. You got it, boss. Tommy and Polly would track the punks down to an old service station where they hung out thanks to information bribed out of one Big Biff, and though initially keen on following Salieri's orders directly and merely injuring the punks, they would quickly be forced into yet another deadly shootout. Tell me a nicest ass I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yo. Oh, Billy, it's the guy from the other night. We gotta go. <laughs> Two of the lead punks would just barely manage to escape Tommy and Polly by car, but unaware of just what kind of a wheelman they were fleeing, they would quite quickly be chased after, and eventually suffer a near-fatal car crash with the Salieri soldiers not far behind. Tommy would be at least somewhat reluctant to flat-out murder a pair of now defenseless men, but with Polly in tow, he would proceed to execute Billy Galati with a shot to the head, with Polly only sparing the other occupant a finishing blow due to being out of rounds and presuming he was already dead from the crash. I want a pop in time. No. No, no, wait. At least... At least I don't want to fucking die, man. Christ, Tom. You can't feel sorry for these animals. A guy like this would plug you if you give him the chance. You gotta pull the trigger without thinking. I'm out. This one's finished too. Hmm. Hmm. <sighs> mm. Oh, Christ, Tom. Snap out of it. You remember what those guys wanted to do to Sarah? Yeah, just, uh... Hey, let's get out of here before the bulls show up, huh? Though he'd already done his fair share of killing up to that point, this incident would appear to be the first of many to truly shock Tommy, having only killed other mobsters who were actively trying to kill him so far, instead of helpless, if morally corrupt, hoodlums, who had no hope of fighting back. To make matters even worse, Tommy would soon after learn that one of the men that Polly had executed was in fact the son of city councilor Roberto Galati, and the other, against all odds, had miraculously survived the car crash, albeit with serious injuries. Simple straight. Oh. I can't afford this life no more. Just getting lucky. I'll give you a chance to win your money back. You want in, boss? We have business to discuss, Polly. We're in it now, boys. One of our associates at the coroner's office sent this over. Corpse's name is Giolotti. You recognize him? Sure. That's one of the punks we ran out of the neighborhood. Now he got the bullet in the back of his head? Yeah. We capped him. Well, the cops ought to thank us. We did him a favor. The guy was a rapist, boss. Yeah? Well, he was also a city councilor's son. 
You want to drive a politician into Morella's arms? There's no better way than killing off his family. Oh, Christ. That gets worse. You left another guy in the wreck? Yeah, but he was dead when we got there. You gonna tell me he was the president's nephew or something? Two in the head, Paulie. If you're gonna do a job, do it right. He made it? Yes. He spent the week in St. Mary's, but he pulled through. <sighs> Can he point a finger at either of you? I don't know. Maybe. Okay. Look. We're gonna kill two birds with one blast. Galati's funeral's today at St. Michael's. Sam, you're gonna attend. Sit in the back and try to spot the lucky bastard. How will I recognize him? He'll be the one who just crawled away from a car wreck. His arm is broken. Look for a sling. Sam's gonna need a little distraction if he's gonna clean up your mess. Are you sending Tommy to dip his wick? Is it brothel? A gentleman's club, just down the street from St. Michael's. The Don has invested a lot of money in it over the years. So me and Sam. Regardless, the owner has suddenly decided to do business with Morello instead of us. You want me to go remind him of his obligations? Yes. Then blow the place up. What? Morello wants to take businesses away from us? He'll inherit craters. Look, Tom, we can send Paulie and Sam since all the ladies know them already. They'd never make it through the front door. But you can walk right in. Okay. What about the manager? Take care of him wherever you find him. If any of the horse see it, well, it'll be a warning. Once he's out of the way, head to his office on the top floor. Grab any documents and money you find there and place the explosives. Vincenzo will see that you have what you need. And you think the blast will be big enough to give me cover? Yeah, but be smart. Only take a shot if you know you won't get made. Tommy, one more thing. One of the girls is passing Morello information about our operations. Before you blow the place, you'll need to take care of her, too. You want Tommy to kill a twist? Come on, Frank. It's just bad luck this falls to Tom. But we gotta protect the family. Her name is Michelle. She's usually working one of the upper rooms. Her photo is in the folder. You boys clear on everything? Yeah. Tom. I got it, boss. Then get it done. In order to simultaneously deal with two problems, Don Salieri would instruct Sam Trapani to attend the funeral of Billy Galati and kill the surviving thug, while Tommy provided cover for the execution by blowing up a brothel, the Corleone Hotel, whose owner had recently decided to do business with Don Morello instead of Don Salieri. No longer expected to simply stand on the sidelines as Sam and Polly did the heavy lifting, Tommy would also be ordered to not only kill the manager and place dynamite inside the building, but also to find and kill a prostitute by the name of Michelle, who was apparently passing information about Salieri's operations to some of Morello's men. Not exactly keen on murdering an innocent woman for her trivial involvement in Mafia affairs, Tommy would nonetheless agree to the job, and prepare to make fireworks with a visit to Vincenzo. But Sam Trapani, being the source of information whom Michelle was gleaning her insights from, would have a rare, for him anyway, change of heart. Sam would personally ask Tommy to try and convince Michelle to leave town instead of outright killing her, and even ask Tommy to give her $100 to facilitate her rapid departure, and Tommy would gladly agree to try and help. <laughs> You, Michelle? What's it to you? Fella named Sam is one of your regulars. Maybe there's a lot of guys named Sam. You know him. Works for Don Celieri. Maybe you got him talking about our business from time to time, and maybe Don Morello offered you some money to spill what you heard. No, Sam, trust me. I, I don't say nothing. He knows that. Well, the Don's losing a lot of money because someone <laughs> can't keep their mouth shut. I was just bumping guys with some of Morello's girls. I didn't mean nothing by it. Tell him I'm sorry. Tell him I won't never open my mouth again. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You scared then? Good. Don't you ever forget how it feels to be this scared. To know you're just one twitch away from a hole in the ground. Because if you ever show your face in this town again, they're gonna find you with two in the head. Do you understand?
Lucky for you, Sam's got a big heart. Get dressed and make tracks. This place is gonna blow soon. Thank you. Just don't come back and we're square. After introducing himself to the manager of the Corleone Hotel in typical mobster fashion, Tommy would make his way to Michelle's room on the second floor and offer her Sam Steele, being sure to frighten her as much as possible to ensure that she did what was asked, knowing that directly disobeying the Don's orders would almost certainly get him killed too. Tommy would then do just as instructed, and rig a load of dynamite in the manager's office in order to create a sufficient distraction for Sam's killing of the thug who got away, and immediately after detonation, make his way across the rooftops until arriving at the church to find the hoodlums still very much alive. We can find redemption in death. Now, William, he was a sinner, yes, but he was also a loving son, a protective brother, and a loyal friend. And for those virtues, we pray that his soul will find salvation. And now, I believe one of Billy's closest and dearest friends would like to say a few words. Thank you, Father. I, uh, I just wanted to pay my respects. Billy, I never said this, but I consider you my brother. I can't even count all the times you saved my ass from a beat. So I don't know how I'm good. What are you doing? Wait, that's the guy. That's the guy who killed Billy! <laughs> After being spotted by the hoodlum while peering into the funeral from the back of the church, Tommy would once again be forced into a shootout in order to survive, this time, ironically, inside the house of God. Tommy would take out all of the thugs standing in his way as he attempted to find and kill the witness to Billy Galati's murder, and thankfully, at the last moment when caught off guard, Sam Trapani would finally make his presence known, carrying out his own orders and killing the witness, even if it was much later than originally planned. What have you done? Murder in the house of God. These men were criminals, Father. Thieves. Rapists. Killers. And God would have embraced them if they'd asked for forgiveness. Now, which one of these men might have sought redemption by working with the poor? Which one might have saved just one life? None of us, Father. You bastard. If you have any confessions to make, you better do it quick. No more bloodshed, please! I'm sorry, Father. <sighs> Consider this an act of divine retribution. <sighs> that make us even? Sure. For now. For your trouble, Father. I don't want your blood money. You took theirs. Not a lot of difference from where I'm standing. That should be enough dough to patch up the bullet holes and keep you quiet. <laughs> when the cops come, you tell them the gunman who did this had East Coast accents. Must have been from out of town, right? I won't lie. But I won't say anything at all. Good. Be a shame if we had to come back here.
By early 1933, Tommy, with all that he'd done for the family already by that point, would obtain the rank of Capo Regime within Salieri's outfit. Though we must stress that it isn't entirely clear when exactly Tommy was given this rank, nor is it clear when he became a made man for the organization. Though it is certain he received this honor eventually, and certainly long before becoming a Capo. In February of that year, Tommy would be tasked by Celieri's accountant, Frank Coletti, with overseeing a shipment of Canadian whiskey manufactured in my neck of the woods, and ensuring that no trouble was met along the way. Thanks for waiting, Tom. The Don and I had to go over last month's numbers again. Sure. So what's the job? I want you to help Sam and Polly with the shipment we've got coming in tonight. The good stuff? Straight from Canada. Where do you need me? Sam's gone to meet our friends from the north at a farm outside of town. Polly will oversee the trucks bringing the shipment into the city, but I want you to go with him. Be an extra pair of eyes. Make sure it all goes smoothly. Okay. Get the car from Ralphie. Meet Paulie at the warehouse. He's got heaters in case you run into any trouble. Sure, Frank. No problem. Good. Now bring the Canadian home safe, Tommy. There is already a case earmarked for the Don. Perhaps unsurprisingly, however, Tommy and Polly would indeed run into trouble when arriving at the farm where the Canadians were meant to meet them along with Sam, and after a brief hesitation, proceed to trudge their way through the mud to find Sam as one of the heaviest rainstorms of the decade poured down upon them. Tommy would investigate the farm and find further hints at foul play before returning to the truck and finding one of their own crew murdered. Ambushed by a group of plainclothes police officers paid off by Morello, Tommy would instinctively defend himself, and soon after meet up with Polly, where the two discovered just who it was Tommy had killed. Hey, buddy! Jesus! Drop your weapon! You first! We don't have time for this. Sorry, pal. Guess we're doing this the hard way. Okay, then. Get over here! I got him pinned down! Oh! It's me, Tom! Polly! What took you so long? We're looking for Sammy. Did you find him? Nah, not yet. Just him. Canadian crew. Dollars to donuts, the rest of the face down in the dirt, too. Christ. They're cops, Tommy. Well, how would I know? They didn't show a badge. God, they didn't say anything. They must be in Morello's pocket. This bastard. He can't even let us have this one racket. Forget about it, Tom. We gotta find Sam and get out of here. Despite the potential slip-up, Tommy and Polly would continue seeking out Sam, and in the process eventually locate the dead Canadian crew, butchered by presumably whoever it was that was keeping Sam from rejoining them. When the two finally did locate their fellow capo, it would be under extreme duress, as Sam attempted to hold out inside of a barn while being fired on from all directions, and eventually taking a hit that put him temporarily out of action. Tommy would fight his way to Sam while Polly retrieved the truck in order to help the injured mobster escape, and in the fighting, several more of Salieri's crew accompanying Tommy would also be murdered by what we presume to have been Morello's men. By the seat of their pants, Tommy and Polly would just barely manage to get Sam loaded onto the back of the truck by the time the LHPD cavalry arrived in an armored car, bent on eliminating them, or at the very least, arresting them. You boys stay here and watch our backs. Plug anyone who gets within 100 yards. Except us. They, 
Can you walk? No, no, I don't think so. Okay, 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 just hang on. I'll go get the truck, then we'll take you to the doctor. Hey, hey, you're gonna make it, Sam. Tommy, hmm. stay here with him. I'll be back, I'll be back in a flash. Okay. It'll be okay, Sam. We survived worse. You sure? You sure we have? Oh, Christ. Tony and Donnie, too? Yeah. What a fucking massacre. How's Sam? Well, he ain't any worse. I'll go get him. Keep an eye out. As it turned out though, Polly would prove himself also capable of being a wheelman when the pressure was down, and thanks to Tommy's precision shooting, the three would manage to survive the encounter and take down numerous cops following them in the process. Though they would leave the meeting empty-handed of any product they could hawk back to their patrons in town, they would also manage to save Sam's life, and get him safely to the Salieri crew's doctor in the dead of night. Polly, we gotta lose him! We did it! We did it! Okay, we're here, Tom! You get Sam out, I'm gonna go wake up the doc! Sam! Sam! We made it. We're at the doctor's house. Paulie, what the hell are you doing here so late? Uh, uh, evening, Doc. Sorry to wake you, but um, we had a little accident. We got an injured man out here. All right, bring him inside. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I'll stay with Sam. You can take the truck back. Call it a night. No, I'll wait. The doc's already got his hands full. No sense in both of us breathing down his neck. Go on, Tom. We'll be fine. Okay. Hey, you did good tonight.
Following his harrowing experience in the country, Tommy would return home to Sarah and find himself actively fearing for his future and the future of his family. In an impulsive moment, Tommy would ask Sarah for her hand in marriage, and the two would eventually commit to a date in June of the following year, as well as eventually having two children, a daughter and a son, though it isn't entirely clear where or when they were born, or even what their names were, likely due to the dramatic changes Tommy's life would see towards the end of the 1930s. You're late. Dinner's cold. Work. About two months later, in April of 1933, Tommy would once again be forced to deal with the reality of mob life in a way that would test his convictions, when Don Salieri learned of a potential mole in the family who was secretly aiding Don Morello, with Tommy being given the order to put them down for good. As it turned out, this mole was none other than Don Salieri's personal accountant in Frank Coletti, whom he had known since he was a young man back in Sicily. And despite this history, Tommy would be expected to track Frank down on his way out of the country and do what was expected of him by killing Frank for his betrayal of the family. Hey, boss. I came as soon as I got your message. Sit down, Tom. We have a mole, Tom. No. Who? I was up all night driving myself nuts trying to figure it out. I started thinking maybe it's one of our guys. We aren't paying his fair share. Someone with a light wallet. Maybe looking to Morello for a new suit. Frank wasn't around, so I went to the safe to get the account books to see who's getting cents on the dollar he's earned. What do you know? The books are gone, Tom. Frank. More than 50 years I've known him. Everything I have, I got with Frank. And every buck we've earned, every dime we've paid out, it's all logged in those books. Frank hands those over to the feds, we're finished. Frank respects one person in this whole town, and that's you. This has got to be some kind of misunderstanding. I've been calling him all day. I went by his place. He's gone. His wife and kid are gone. But why? I don't know. I'm sure he has his reasons. Maybe he's still smarting over the dog. But when you tried to drown? Yeah. <sighs> Same one I shot after he wouldn't let me sink her. I was a stupid kid, Tommy. But grudge or no grudge, we gotta get those books back. Shake down all our stories. See who knows what. And when you catch up to Frank, you get those books. And if he doesn't have them on him, you make him tell you where to find them. After that, you do what we gotta do.
Tommy would, at least initially, set off to do just as he was told, locating Frank at a safe house in Oakwood where he pursued him all the way to Lost Heaven International Airport. With a plane already fueled and plans in place for his departure back to Europe, Frank would nearly escape Salieri's grasp entirely, but a resourceful Tommy Angelo would either by force or by stealth manage to catch up just in time to catch Frank preparing to board the plane to safety. Tom. Frank, the Don sent me. I figured as much. I'm sorry it had to be you, Tommy. Anything you want me to tell him? I wish it could have shaken out better, but Morello finally came after me. It's okay. You can come out. Morello offered me a simple trade. The Don's account books for our lives and tickets out of this town. You hand the books over yet? I'm not so stupid, Don. They're safe. Morello was waiting for this. It's a key to a box in the Grand Imperial Bank downtown. I told Morello I'd hand it over after the plane was fueled and ready to go. His men were meant to fetch it before we left. I took care of them. Tell them to get on a plane. Go on march, Alice. Get aboard. Frank, you're coming with us. Not right now, honey. Just get buckled in. Tommy and I, we have some serious business to discuss. But Frank... Get on the plane, march! For Alice. For me. Get on the goddamn plane, please. You been paid yet? Yeah. Now you've been paid twice. You take the ladies wherever they want to go. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tom. Christ, Frank. Why didn't you ask us for help? I guess I just wanted out. One way or the other. I'm tired, Tommy. Tired of lying to my wife. Tired of checking under my car every time I take a Sunday drive. And tired of waiting for the dawn to put two in my temple. However, despite the enormous risk to himself and his own family should he fail his mission, Tommy would be seemingly unable to kill Frank in cold blood right in front of his family, having a particular history with the man that went above and beyond any target he had thus far been told to eliminate. The two would strike a sort of deal, with Frank giving Tommy the key to a safety deposit box at the Grand Imperial Bank containing the books on Salieri's operation, and Tommy allowing Frank to live and depart Lost Heaven with his family, with plans to report Frank's death back to the Dawn in the aftermath. And in fact, Tommy would do just that. He would tell Don Salieri that he'd personally killed Frank, and even be tasked with burning Frank's home down just before the funeral, as a way of symbolically cleaning house for a new era. I got the books and covered my tracks. Salieri never asked any questions. In fact, apart from the funeral, I never heard him talk about Frank again.
You're making my boys twitchy, Marku. Sergio and I just came by to pay respects, that's all. Known Frank a long time. Almost as long as you. He's a good man. Smart. Loyal. <laughs> Loyal to his wife. His kid above all else. There must be some kind of honor in that in you. Maybe. But I'm still looking at this headstone with his little girl's name on it. It's a hell of a thing. Later that year, in the summer of 33, Tommy would learn from Salieri about a prosecutor on Don Morello's payroll who was rumored to be ready to leak information that directly tied Salieri's crew to the murder of Billy Galati. And once again, Tommy would be asked to clean up the mess. He would be tasked with escorting an expert safecracker straight from Italy, Salvatore, onto the premises of the prosecutor's mansion, and sneak inside to steal whatever evidence he had on Salieri, and by extension, Tommy, for his role in Billy's death. Look at these houses. Big yards, white picket fences. It's the American dream, eh, Tommy? I suppose. Not for you? No, sir. I don't like being closer to the business. Don't let the flower beds and front porches fool you. There's more criminals out here than in the rest of the city combined. Are that why we're in the neighborhood? In a way. Morell's got a dirty prosecutor on his payroll named Watkins. Turns out he's old friends with Galati. The city councilor? The same. Morell let drop that we might have had something to do with the Galati boy's death. Now Watkins is loaded for bear, trying to do right by his buddy. Word is, he's striking gold with a few witnesses. You have names? Yeah. But Paulie and Sam are taking care of them. I'm putting you on a different part of the job. We need whatever Watkins has got on us. And where's he holding? A safe in his villa. <laughs> I'm no safe cracker. <laughs> Don't worry about that. We're taking you to meet Salvatore. He's fresh off the boat, but he knows how to pop open anything. Just get him into the villa, find the safe, and he'll do the rest. What kind of rumpus should I expect? Nothing you can't handle. Watkins is going to the theater, so the house should be empty except for a bit of muscle. The office is on the first floor, and our stoolie says the safe is in the wall. Once Salvatore has the safe open, grab all the evidence and get out. That him, boss? Yeah, that's our guy. Salvatore, tutto bene? Si, grazie. Don Salieri. Good to see you. You know the job. Don't let me down. Si. Who capisce? Tommy, if you bump into Watkins, don't kill him. It'll just bring down more heat. You got it, boss. Buona fortuna, ragazzi. Tommy. Tommy Angelo. Piacere di di conoscerti. Meraviglioso. <laughs> Luckily, the two would indeed manage to sneak their way onto the property, and Salvatore would work his safe-cracking magic. But on the way out, they would be forced to deal with not only Morello's goons attempting to stop them, but also the LHPD, when an impatient Tommy inadvertently triggered the mansion's alarms by digging around inside the safe for evidence, before Salvatore had a chance to explain or disarm the system. Had it been anyone else in Salieri's crew, their chances for success might have been slim. But with Tommy's particularly adept skills with both a firearm and a motor car, the two thieves would manage to escape the mansion untouched, and evade the police long enough to drop their trails and report back to Don Salieri with news of their success. Excuse <sighs> me. Sure. Show me what you can do. Shit. Be quick, Salvatore. Pacenza, pacenza. Nice work, excuse me. Ah, cool. 
paura ed è collegato all'allarme what? inzappolato doesn't matter come on we need to get out of here vai dietro dietro even with one more metaphorical bullet dodged, however, the Celieri family would be far from problem-free by this time, as they attempted to find a replacement for the loss of the Canadian whiskey suppliers mere months before the city of Lost Heaven and the rest of America repealed prohibition and made the entire endeavor far less lucrative. In September, Polly would overhear a group of Kentucky whiskey suppliers who were regular customers of the Morello family and discover that they too had reason enough to be dissatisfied with their deal and were already looking for a new buyer. Polly would set up a deal with the moonshiner, William Gates, and his crew at a parking garage where they planned to stage their deal as a faux robbery from Morello, but as it become so common by then, things wouldn't exactly go as planned. This is the last of the good stuff, boss. I know. Some of those bottles I've had for ten years. But we gotta make payroll. Get it out of here. You heard him. Load it up. Good to see you, boys. Boss, any word on a job I pulled with Salvatore? You did fine, Tom. Galati's got nothing on us now. We bought some time. At least until the money runs out. Don't go selling off the farm yet, boss. Sam says you worked out an angle. Yeah, and you're gonna love it. We make a few bucks and knock out a couple of Morello's teeth, too. Okay, what's the rumpus? A couple of weeks ago, I'm relaxing in the cigar lounge at the Blue Tropics. Where? Some small-time whorehouse. It's just a couple of closets with some mattresses on the floor. It's a gentleman's club. They got a bar and everything. <laughs> Anyways, one of the Johns is south, and he's crying to the madam about all his troubles. He catches my ear on account of his goofy accent. He's going on and on about how he just landed this huge payday. But the goons he's working for are already twisting his arm, and he's got the busted nose to show for it. You pick up his tab? Hell no. But I walked him out of the place, took him to the diner around the corner to sober up. We get to talking. Turns out his name is Gates. He's this hick up from Kentucky. Moonshiner? Uh-uh-uh. Better. His pop's got a couple of real distilleries, and I'll give you one guess as to their exclusive buyer around these parts. Morello. And you think he wants to burn bridges? Oh, yeah. I've been working him steady, boss. He's bringing up another shipment tonight, but he's got his entire crew ready to roll over. All we gotta do is make it look like a proper heist. I don't know, Polly. You really trust this guy? He's got no love for Morello, I'll tell you that. Not like we got a lot of options here. Mm. We'll be cutting up the last beam pretty soon, boss. What do you think, Tom? We need to replace the Canadian. If Polly says this Gates can do that, I'm in. Where's the meat? The big parking garage downtown. Okay, do it. But you better not be playing grab ass this time. You take Carlo and little Bill with you. Sure thing, boss. Once you have the truck, drive it back here. When Morello's soldiers arrived at nearly the worst possible time, they would immediately engage with Sam, Polly, Tommy, and the rest of the crew on top of injuring Gates and killing all of his accompanying henchmen. With Gates hurt but still alive, the Salieri boys would flee the building still holding onto the whiskey shipment and fight their way through dozens of Morello's men in the process with Tommy and Polly covering Sam as they exited the garage and delivered the booze to the family warehouse while being pursued by Morello thugs the entire way. Polly, good to see you, pal. Yeah, you too, Gates. Well, I hope you all have good taste in whiskey. I ain't really the expert here. Tommy! Oh, yeah. It's fine. Your first payment. If the Don's impressed, he'll finance more runs. And each one's gonna be bigger than the last. We're all gonna be rich, boys. Well, we are always happy to do business with good folks like Don Salieri. Please, give him my regards. Sure thing. Now we just gotta conclude this transaction. Whoa. Damn it, Paulie! Uh, no, no! It's okay. Oh, what? 
I told you, we gotta make it look like a proper robbery. Damn thing gonna be crooked by the time I'm done with this city. Ah, uh, don't worry, pal. With all the dough you're raking in, you're gonna be able to pay for a new one. <laughs> Watch out! At least for a couple of months, Salieri and his crew would be back in business selling illegal alcohol to the denizens of Lost Heaven. But by December of 1933, Prohibition would be repealed, and all of their efforts would seem to have been for nothing. Looks like a 38. Morello's boys caught up with you? Yeah, boss. We took care of it. What about the kid from Kentucky? Well, he took a slug to the shoulder, but uh, he's a tough blocker. He and his crew dusted out as soon as we bumped off Morello's hatchet, man. Getting shot will give Gates and his pop another reason to ice Morello out of the whiskey business. Well, let's see if this hooch was worth all the trouble. Excellent. I'll work out the details with Papa Gates. But once we're running this Kentucky Brown, we'll be back in brass buttons. Good work, son. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all of you. Saludo! Saludo! With or without the sale of illegal alcohol to boost their numbers though, Salieri's crew would continue to find ways to stay relevant and keep their soldiers paid, with Tommy often finding himself at the center of the family's troubles as one of the most reliable earners and capos. Now a family man himself, having married Sarah Marino in June of 1934 and likely having their first child sometime in early to mid-1935, Tommy would find himself at a crossroads when on May 1st of that year, he was inadvertently present for the beginning of a mafia war that would embroil the city for several weeks to come. I have been looking forward to this all week. Where will you taste the cassata, Tommy? Oh. oh, more wine. Hey, more wine here, please, quickly. <laughs> You're going to love this wine. It's a... Don't forget it. Welcome, my friend. Welcome. <laughs> Good to see you, Pepe. Yes. Hey, come. Our guest has arrived, eh? What's on the menu today? My mother, she would be so honored if you tried her caponada. Excellent, bravo, bravo. Oh, Danny, oh, let me get you a chair for you, huh? Sit, please. And to drink, a Chianti. I've been saving this just for you. Yeah, bene, bene, bene. Okay. Enjoy, huh? I'm glad you're off the roof, Tom. Uh, Sarah threatened to leave me if I didn't dry out. I know. She told you? No. I put her up to it. Drunkards get sloppy, Tom. I didn't want you to make a mistake we couldn't live with. <laughs> uh, for you? And for you. <laughs> Peppy! The meal is a masterpiece as always. <laughs> Molto grazie, Don Salieri. Praise from such a gourmet as you, it filled me with a joy. Uh, you wouldn't call me a gourmet if you knew what I had for supper. <laughs> when Don Salieri's personal driver and the son of one of the Don's personal friends going back to the old days, Carlo, calls in sick for a day, Don Salieri would ask Tommy to temporarily fill in and drive him to Pepe's restaurant for what would ostensibly have been a relaxing meal. But Don Morello would have other plans. At the restaurant, Tommy would learn that Don Salieri had personally asked Sarah to threaten Tommy with divorce, or at the very least separation, should he fail to stop drinking as regularly as he had become known to, likely attempting to drown his accumulating fears of death and loss over the now five years of working for a violent criminal organization. <laughs> Could 
have at least let me finish my wine. Hey, Salieri! Come out of there and we'll make this quick. Smoke them out, Joe. Shit, watch out! Going out the front door. Can you move? Not fast enough. We're gonna ambush these boys. I'll keep them entertained while you slip out the back and circle around. You sure, boss? Blow them all down, Tommy. Not one of them goes home tonight. Okay, boss. Be careful. Tom, just be quick about it. Originally unaware of Salieri's involvement, he would indeed manage to be sober that day, and ironically, it may have even saved his life. As partway through their meal, Morello's men would pull up in front of Pepe's and proceed to pepper the entire restaurant with bursts of Thompson machine gun fire, in the hopes of finally putting the rivalry between Salieri and Morello to rest. Luckily for Salieri, Tommy would spot the assassins just in time, and manage to get himself and his boss to temporary safety as the building was fired at with reckless abandon. Furious at the audacity of such an attempt, Don Salieri would instruct Tommy to circle around at their attackers while he remained inside to keep their attention, and after fleeing out the back door, Tommy would eventually cut his way through the men and ambush those at the front of the restaurant, still searching for a dead Don Salieri. At least, they'd hoped. Oh, look at the balls on this kid. You really saved my ass, Tom. We gotta go, boss. The cops will be here soon. I need a minute to catch my breath. Well, let me get you back to the bar. No, not the bar. We're going to see Carlo. That son of a bitch knew where I was going today, and he calls in sick. He set you up. <sighs> to us, Tom, you could have ended up just as dead. Yeah, I know, boss. Carlo's jacked up with some Damon Holbrook. Let's go see what he has to say about all this. But a mob boss of Salieri's reputation seemingly couldn't be killed quite that easily. And after regrouping outside of the restaurant, Salieri would know immediately who to speak with next, with his driver calling in sick no longer appearing to be a mere coincidence. Tommy would bring Salieri to Carlo's apartment, and the furious mob boss would personally begin assaulting his former driver, with Tommy being forced to pursue him down to street level when he manages to shake off the elderly but intensely angry mobster. Tommy would shoot Carlo as he tried to get away, but still breathing just barely, Don Salieri would catch up to them and personally put an end to Carlo by smashing his head in with his boot, in a display of violence that shocked even Tommy. Boss, why don't you let me go first, huh? Carlo might be waiting for us. No, Tom, my face is going to be the first and last thing this bastard sees. <laughs> what the fuck? You goddamn dirty grifter. You better dangle, sweetheart. It's gonna be a closed casket, Carlo. <laughs> You okay, bus? Yeah, just a little one. Let me catch my breath. Ah! Jesus, he's fast for a big guy. Don't let him get away! Is he still alive? I'm not sure. Now officially at war with the Morello crime family, the following weeks would see the Salieri crew, and Tommy in particular, ramp up their efforts to cut Morello off of his many resources, one at a time, starting with one of his biggest political allies in Roberto Gilotti. When Gilotti set up public plans for a celebration of his 50th birthday aboard the steamboat The Lost Heaven Queen, the Salieri family would pay the boat's janitor to stash a revolver in one of the boat's bathrooms for Tommy who would then be expected to murder the city councilor just as he finished up his speech and ushered in the celebratory fireworks. Our guy's in place. Good. 
I'm finally going after her. Soon. But first, we have to soften him up. Morel's got the cops, the politicians, and even some judges in his pocket. We can't afford to bite them all off. So we need to scare them into abandoning Morella's sinking ship. We bump off the right engine. The rest are going to realize sticking with Morello ain't too good for their health. First in line for the pine box is this asshole, Galati. The counselor's still seeing red over his dead kid, so he's never going to turn on Morello. Christ, that guy's been giving us fits since 32. Let me take care of him, boss. Why do you think you're here? Then he's got it all figured out. Counselor is celebrating his birthday with a big shindig on a steamboat. He's pulling out all the stops, booths, broads, fireworks. He's even giving a speech to the press. What kind of security? Just did normal detail, a few guys with Roscoe's. None of the other fellas are gonna do dick to protect that piece of shit. Okay, I'll talk my way to the party, put two on his head. Slow down, Junior. Galati's corrupt, but he ain't stupid. His crew be searching everyone who comes on board, so you can't be carried. So, what? Uh, throw him overboard, see if he can swim. Don't go getting creative on me. You're still going to shoot him, for fuck's sake. When you get on deck, you make for the head. We got a janitor on the take, and he's planted a revolver in the bathroom. And then you just cool your heels. Mingle. Try not to look like a hatchet man until Galati makes his appearance. You wait for that bastard to start his speech, and only then do you put one between his eyes. We want it done in public to get people talking. Sure. But you got a plan for getting back to shore? Sam and Paul are down the docks working on that. You meet up with him there, and they'll fill you in on the rest of the details. Okay. The lot is done, boss. You won't have to worry about him after tonight. I don't doubt it, Tommy. Buona fortuna, Tom. Polly and Sam would ensure that a crew member bound for the steamboat ran into a bit of trouble on the way and provide Tommy with a disguise to easily slip aboard unnoticed in preparation for the assassination. Just as planned, Tommy would gun down Galati from the top deck just as he finished giving his speech, and thanks to Polly and Sam, actually managed to get off the boat alive after fighting his way through dozens of Galati's bodyguards in order to escape. Hey, John. Hope you're enjoying yourself. As long as the bar stays open, counselor. <laughs> Good man. Have a note for me, huh? Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Their next target would be none other than Don Morello's younger brother and most prolific earner, Sergio Morello, who was in charge of the unions and bringing in goods through the Lost Heaven Harbor, where Tommy's father had worked until his death. After a failed attempt on Sergio's life by Sam Trapani and Vincenzo Ricci, the task of eliminating the Morello family underboss would instead fall to Tommy, and he would be instructed to use a car bomb given to him by Vincenzo and rig it to Sergio's car for explosive results. <laughs> it could be worse, huh? We could be peeling you off the front of the train. He just got a good break is all. Sergio Morella's always been lucky. He was born with more brains than his brother, that's for sure. We'll get him, boss. No, you two are off this job. You're broken mirrors on this one. We'll let the guy who killed Galati take a crack. Tommy here's got all the politicians scared. Maybe he can put Sergio in the ground. What do I need to know about this guy? Besides, he's got a lucky rabbit's foot up his ass. Sergio is Morello's top earner. He controls the unions, which means he controls the docks and attacks everything that's imported into the city. We kill him, and a big part of Morello's income will be wiped out. Any ideas on how to get to him? I don't want to end up in a tree like these two. You're going to scatter his ashes. It's a custom job. Attach it to the starter under his car. He'll be a human torch as soon as he turns the key. It's safe to carry. Yes, yeah, don't drop it. Shake it. Smoke near it. Yeah, it's safe. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Get it done, Tommy. We're all our guys Morales killed. 
and for all the money he's taken out of our pockets. I'll take care of it, boss. Unfortunately, after successfully rigging Sergio's car, Tommy would witness not Sergio, but his wife as she prepared to use the vehicle, and whilst mid-conversation with his own wife, Sarah, from the phone booth across the street, desperately tried to prevent the murder of yet another innocent, but too late to prevent the inevitable. Yeah, I'll be home before supper. Hey, you wanna go dancing this weekend? Maybe drop the kid off at your pop's place. Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, Christ. Hey! Stop! No, no, no. It all went bad. Hey, pull it together, Tom. Whatever happened, happened. There's nothing you can do about it now. Sergio's luck is running out. What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? Sam and Paulie have found him. He's in Georgie's restaurant across town. You need to get over there fast. Okay. Emotionally shaken by witnessing the death of Sergio's wife at his own hands, Tommy would quickly phone into Salieri's and learn from Vincenzo that despite his own failure, Polly and Sam had managed to track Sergio down to a diner, where they were sure his luck would finally run out. Tara, you okay? Yeah, this is a car bomb. Things went south. We could draw about it later. Right now we gotta get that bastard. Let's go! The hell? We got a message from Mr. Salieri. No! Kill these clowns! Get me out of here! Back to the car. We gotta catch up before that idiot gets himself killed. Tommy would meet up with Sam and Polly at the diner and locate Sergio just where they'd expect him to be. But Tommy, already having witnessed the death of one innocent bystander that day, would step in at the last moment to stop Polly from firing right through a waitress that Sergio was using as a human shield and give the younger Morella brother one more opportunity to escape. However, even with his soft heart for those uninvolved in criminal activity, Tommy would nonetheless continue pursuing Sergio with dogged determination, and follow the fleeing mobster on a motorcycle as Polly and Sam attempted to keep pace. Though they would quickly be thrown out of the picture due to Sam's less than stellar driving, Tommy would follow Sergio all the way to the rail yards, and continue pursuing his way through the Morello goons to gun down the underboss no matter what it took. Though both men would run out of ammunition right as Tommy caught up with Sergio, Tommy would improvise by setting fire to the leaking barrels of Trago motor oil surrounding the younger Morello brother and finally kill the lucky bastard in a massive explosion which could likely be heard from across multiple neighborhoods. What are you idiots doing? Kill that motherfucker! You just winged me, asshole! You think you're the guy who's gonna kill me? <laughs> what did I tell you? No one can touch me. You ain't that lucky, bastard. Wait. No! <laughs> 
By May 20th of 1935, just 20 days after Morello's attempted assassination at Pepe's restaurant, the Salieri and Morello families had become embroiled in an all-out gang war, with headlines hitting the Lost Heaven Courier, and Don Morello himself beginning to hide out following the death of his brother and further escalation to the conflict. Rapidly losing influence from his lack of visibility, Morello would set up plans to host a charity gala at a theater on Central Island, and seeing opportunity, Salieri's crew would in turn plan to be in attendance. Morello wants to thumb his nose at us. Taking a show like there's not a war on, we'll meet him in the streets. We do him like this. We wait outside the theater till the end of the show. All those rich assholes will start coming out. That's when we hit Morello and his gorillas in a crowd before they see us coming. The theater is going to be packed, and not just with seps. There's a good chance the mayor, maybe even the chief, might be there, too. That's the goddamn point, Tom. We kill Morello in public, in front of the city's creme de la creme. Then they'll all know who's in charge. And it doesn't matter if you have a badge or a gavel or a fat wad of cash in your pocket. If you cross Salgari and his boys, you're dead. Okay, boss. We'll get it done. You take the machine guns. Make sure you don't draw attention to yourselves hanging around outside the theater. You keep the choppers hidden until you spot Morello. And then you light him up. I want it to look like that white suit is covered in roses. You got it. Sure, boss. Tommy, Sam, and Polly would arrive at the theater just as Morello was leaving and immediately open fire on him. But the Don would manage to survive the initial onslaught and make it to his car where his driver put the pedal to the metal in escaping Salieri's men. After him! He's got muscle waiting. I see him! Tommy and company would follow Morello all the way to Lost Heaven International, and after fighting their way through even more of his soldiers lying in wait, managed to catch up to the boss just as he got to his escape plane, stealing yet another car in order to follow it out onto the runway. Get us into the air! We don't have the speed! Take us up! Being both the best shot and the best driver, Tommy would first take out the plane's engines while firing from inside the vehicle, and soon after take the wheel to follow the smoking plane to its inevitable crash site, just outside of town. Tommy, Sam, and Polly would find Don Morello still barely clinging to life following the crash, and a jaded and likely overworked Tommy Angelo would personally unload a clip of ammunition from his Thompson into the mobster's white suit, now covered in roses, just as he'd been instructed. The war with Don Morello was finally over. Jesus Christ. Bastard's daddy doesn't even know it yet. He knows it now. Yeah, pal. That'll do it. Let's make tracks. Over the course of the next three years, the Salieri crime family would take control of nearly all of Morello's former rackets, and effectively place themselves as the new kings of organized crime in the city. No longer embroiled in a deadly mob war on a daily basis, the organization would, by most accounts, become ever so slightly less violent, though only due to their lack of competition. But as a wise man once said, all good things must come to an end. By July of 1938, with a gubernatorial election rapidly drawing close, Salieri would become weary of one of the candidates bringing an uncomfortable amount of attention to the threat of organized crime, Hank Turnbull. 
and throw his best gunman back into the line of fire by tasking Tommy with assassinating the would-be governor for his apparent hypocrisy, but in reality, his potential to make life for the Salieri crew particularly difficult. Any trouble? No, boss. No trouble at all. Got something else for me? Paulie's feels a little light. There's a little extra in mind to cover the difference. You ever go swimming, Tom? Been to the shore a few times, sure. I knew a couple of guys once. Took some dames out to the lake. Had a few beers, a few laughs. Then one of them decides to go in the water. Gets to the center of the lake and realizes he's running out of steam. Can't make it back in. He starts shouting for help. Now the other guy, he's a strong swimmer. He goes out in the lake to drag his buddy back to shore. Problem is, the first guy, the one too stupid to know when the water's too deep for him, he panics. Grabs his friend by the neck and they both go under and don't come up again. Paulie's your friend, and I know you're loyal to him, and I respect that. But don't you ever pay his tab again. Okay, boss. Good. Now, we gotta talk about this Turnbull. The guy running for governor? The same. He's been flapping his gums a lot about cracking down on our businesses. <laughs> That's rich. He spent more on whores than Paulie and Sam combined. <laughs> you want me to pay him a visit? Maybe put him on a take? No. You can't trust a hypocrite, Tom. We need to end his campaign aspirations, and in a way that keeps anyone from stepping up to the same platform. Vinny, have a plan then? Of course. Turnbull's holding a rally near Central Island. The spot he picked is hard to reach and out in the open. Should have a beautiful view of the rally from the tower of the old prison. From there, you'll give Turnbull a third eye. Okay. I'll go see Vinny about the gun. But don't forget, you only got one shot. You miss, and his crew will usher him out of there quick. I'm the best shooter you got. Otherwise, you would be talking to someone else. Then get it done. Using a paid-off contact at the old prison to facilitate Tommy's sneaking inside, he would climb his way through the crowds of Lost Heaven's less than fortunate lower class and reach a vantage point on the old prison guard tower, where a sniper rifle had been stashed just for the occasion. Tommy would indeed manage to kill Turnbull in the midst of his speech, and was subsequently forced to flee through dozens of pursuing LHPD officers after taking a nasty fall from the old prison's decaying infrastructure giving way under his feet. But despite his success, Tommy would soon after be confronted by his own wife, Sarah, and reminded of the realities his criminal lifestyle enabled, by emphasizing Turnbull's integral role in helping to pass the 19th Amendment, even at a great risk to his own career. Did you hear about this Turnbull? Heard he was crooked as the day is long. It says in the paper he's going to be remembered for fighting to pass the 19th Amendment put his whole career on the line for it. Which one was that again? Woman suffrage, you idiot. He gave me the right to vote, Tom. Gave it to his wife and six daughters, too. Guess nobody's just one thing, are they? Guess not. I gotta go to work. <sighs> Tom. Don't do nothing you don't want to be remembered for, you hear me? Bradley, too late for that. <laughs> this likely served as yet another straw on the camel's back when examining his own role within the Salieri crime family. And just over a month later, he would finally be pushed over the edge when doing an otherwise routine job for the Don, along with his associates, Polly and Sam. In September of 1938, the Salieri Capos would be tasked with helping to smuggle in several shipments of high-quality cigars through the Lost Heaven Harbor, but an increasingly paranoid Tommy would almost immediately become suspicious of the job when initially given the details by the Don himself. 
With Tommy rightly calling out the job as being small time, Don Salieri would eventually reveal the real purpose of their mission, to ensure the smuggled cigars made it to their destination not just because of the quality tobacco, but because of a supposed stash of diamonds hidden among the boxes. Excellent. Yeah, it's great, boss. And this is just a taste. I got a line on a whole shipment of Cameroons that have been impounded by customs. You guys are going to grab them. You want us to boost cigars? Something wrong with that? Customers in our nightclubs are paid through the nose for quality cigars. Still, it seems... I don't know. Small time. I just knew you were a smart one, Tom. Can't put nothing past you. Small time is exactly right. That's how it's supposed to look, anyhow. The cigars are just a cover for a shipment of hot ice. The smuggled diamonds have been hidden in some of the boxes. The feds haven't found them yet. We're stealing diamonds from the feds? Don't worry about it. I've already discussed all the details with Sam here. He'll fill you in. Now, I got a meeting with the mayor at his favorite gentleman's club. Work out the details together. But I want those cigars back here before anyone catches on to the real loot. You got it? Sure, boss. Great. And don't drink all the good stuff while I'm gone. You know about this. Boss and I worked it out last night. We got a plan. Now, I'm not saying it's a good plan, but it won't get us killed. Probably. So what, then? We got a guy on the inside or something? No. We got to do this on our own. And it'll be rough. Cigars are packed in crates at the harbor. Shit. The place will be crawling with security. Yeah. Brute force won't work. Got to play this one cool. So we're going to steal a customs truck. Slip right in. Christ. And kill the poor bastard driver. No. We'll just scare him a bit. All we need is his paperwork. Right. We don't need the hassle of dumping a body. Come on. Let's see if we can get eyes on a customs truck down by the docks. You all right, Tom? Yeah. Just trying to figure out the angle is up. What's there to figure? Boss says a job needs doing, we're doing it. Just seems like a lot to put on the line. Even for some diamonds. The feds pinch us. We can do serious time. Then let's make sure we don't get caught. Right? Yeah. Still unsure of exactly why Salieri was risking his three most valuable capos on such a seemingly small-time job, Tommy would attempt to drop the issue and proceed towards the Federal Customs Impound with Sam and Polly. But along the way, Polly would plant the seed that ultimately spelled his own demise. No longer making enough money from his regular duties as a capo to satisfy him, Polly would begin planning his own big-time score by scouting out the Grand Imperial Bank in preparation for a major robbery, which Polly initially planned to keep from the dawn. Being closer to the dawn and more financially stable than his friend, Sam Trapani, along with Tommy, would attempt to dissuade Polly from his master plan, and after some convincing, seemed to bring Polly around to the reality that he would only end up getting himself buried right next to Morello for betraying Salieri's trust. Would you relax? You're making me nervous playing around with your piece like that. Sorry. Just got a lot on my mind as well. <laughs> that show. I'd have figured there wasn't enough room up there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and laugh, assholes. You guys are done. I don't even think I got plans. But you're wrong. You got big plans. Yeah. Spill it then. What are you working on? Been thinking about hitting up a savings and loan downtown. 
You want to rob a bank? Sure. I've been casing the place for months. I got it all worked out. I just need a few guys I can count on to watch my back. We're robbing a bank that's a little out of our league. We're robbing the fucking feds, ain't we? What's the difference? Well, Salieri's the goddamn difference, you nitwit. The Don sent us to steal these cigars. There ain't no way he sanctions a bank job. Well, then we don't tell him. You want to step out on the Don? No. Not really. We can cut him in after we make the score. He'll be bent, sure. But he won't stay mad once he gets his share. I don't know, Polly. Yeah, I fucking know. You do what you want. I won't say nothing. Yeah, I owe you that much. But Salieri? When he finds out you're going behind his back, you'll be planted right next to Morello. You ask me, there ain't no hall worth that. He's right, Polly. You bring it to the Don, or let it go. Just get to daydreaming, you know. Wake up. We're here. Tom, you take the car. Find a custom truck and meet us near the impound. Me and Polly, we'll go get the rest of the gear. Right. You got your head together. Yeah. Sober as a priest. That's what I'm afraid of. Hey, quit busting my balls. I'm good. Tommy would go on to locate and steal a customs truck to use in the infiltration, and Sam and Polly would change into their stolen uniforms in order to pose as customs workers and make the robbery run as smoothly as possible. Having only two uniforms, however, Tommy would be forced to ride in the back of the truck to the customs impound and proceed to sneak his way through the building and locate the impounded cigars, while Sam and Polly kept a lookout by the truck. Tommy would eventually manage to find the cigars and safely deliver them back to the truck, but no longer content with sitting in the back, decided to take the wheel himself as their best driver, which only proved doubly important when their cover was blown and alarms began sounding off across the compound. You sure we're getting what we came for? We're aces, boys. Good. Let's get them loaded and get out of here. <laughs> That's the last of them. Let's dangle. I'm not riding in the back again. You're a better wheelman anyway. Just don't drive us into the bay. Shit. You hear that? After evading numerous roadblocks set up by the LHPD to catch them, and fighting off the few ambitious officers who still attempted to gun them down, Tommy, Sam, and Polly would arrive back at Salieri's warehouse with all of the impounded goods, but discover that during the escape from the authorities, one of the cigar crates had been badly damaged. Checking to make sure none of the product had been damaged, Tommy and his friends would soon discover that the real prize all along had been not a load of priceless diamonds, but instead black tar heroin, which had up to that point explicitly been banned by Don Salieri himself as a vice even they wouldn't touch, which was likely only made worse by the truth being kept from them. Hey, Polly! You okay? Yeah! Yeah, a couple of these crates are shot to shit, though. How bad is it? It's the worst of it. Ah, it don't look too good. Don's gonna be pissed if we ruined any of the cigars. What the hell? Christ. It's dope. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Where are the diamonds? There ain't any. This is the real score. No. No, 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 no. Don said we would get diamonds. You can open every box. You're not going to find them. We put our fucking necks out on the line for this shit. Looks like it. 
better cool off, Polly. The Don's coming. Shit. We don't say nothing about this to the Don. Okay, if he wanted us to know, he would have told us. He should have come clean. Sure. But for now, we keep our trap shut. Right? Yeah, okay. Polly? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I ain't saying nothing. Any problems, boys? One of the crates got a little banged up, is all. All right? Oh, that doesn't look too bad. Might have lost a few cigars, but otherwise the merchandise should be okay, boss. Besides, ain't diamond supposed to be the hardest thing around? Outside of my cock, maybe. Well, bravo, boys, bravo. You all got a well-deserved bonus coming your way. You want us to unload the crates into the warehouse? No, you can take a powder. These morons are gonna take it from here. You sure? what I say? Okay, boss. We'll dangle. Sam, give me a lift back to the bar. Sure, boss. You guys coming? Now nah, we'll take the train. Okay. See you later. Yeah, but what are you gonna do? I already told you. The bank. Yeah. I don't care what Sam says. I'm getting that score. How much you figure? You want in? We're just talking. I knew I could count on you, pal. Possibly already privy to the real product hidden inside the cigar boxes, Sam Trapani would attempt to keep both Tommy and Polly from confronting Don Salieri about his deception, and personally drive Salieri home from his warehouse, while Tom and Polly took the train back home and discussed Polly's plans to rob the Grand Imperial, which now only seemed more worthwhile, knowing that even their supposedly loyal boss was cutting them out of heavy profits. You got a family to look after. I get that. But think about what this could mean for them. Watch it, buddy. You're treading into enemy territory without a map. Yeah. I don't know what it's like for you going home to your wife and kid. But that's why I'm doing this. Who's gonna marry me? Nearly 40 years old and nothing to show for it but my rap sheet. But we do this? I get enough scratch to finally get out? Who knows? You're not built for the domestic life, Polly. Six months in, you'll put a bullet in your brain out of boredom. Christ. I'm ready to punch my ticket right now. We sit around for six months, just playing cards and busting balls, and I start to get lazy. Then everything blows up, and I gotta knock the rust off or I'm dead. One day I'm fighting to stay awake while the Don's telling us a story about the old days. One I've already heard a hundred times, and the next day, the next day I'm getting shot at, I'm trying to keep from shit in my pants. It's fucking wearing me out, Tommy. So you're looking for the big one, though? I know, it's a snipe hunt. Every little monster goes to bed dreaming about that last big score. But if we do this thing, I don't know. Might be just enough to get me a little pizzeria or something, you know? Sure. But if we're doing this, we're waiting till things calm down. Ah, you're already hooked, pal. Maybe. After some convincing on Tommy's part, he would eventually relent to staking out the job with Polly, and even accompany him to the robbery, all without plans to tell the Don from fear of reprisals, and in part to get back at him for lying about the cigar shipment. Knowing that his money troubles would only get worse if even Salieri was cutting him out of things, Tommy would agree to robbing the Grand Imperial with Polly, 
and on November 3rd of that year, commit to carrying out one of the largest armed robberies in the city's history, with just him, Polly, and a couple of loaded guns. Plan stays the same. Right. I take care of the crowd, you handle the manager. Threats don't work. Do what you gotta do. Keeps the vault keys on them. See, a teller sounds the alarm. How long do we get? Five minutes. Maybe more. For the cop show. What if it all goes to hell? I'm not fucking around, Tom. You hear gunshots down at the vault? Don't come up. It's the money or nothing at all. Doing this? We're doing it. Everyone's down on the floor! Get the fuck down! Not you, ladies. Stay where we can see your pretty faces. Anybody moves, I'll pop them! The two men would burst into the bank in broad daylight and terrorize the clerks and staff in order to show that they meant business. While Polly watched the main floor, Tommy would track down and threaten the bank manager into opening the vault, and despite his attempts to keep the situation bloodless, also be forced to kill several security guards in the bank's lower levels, before taking the manager's key and helping himself to the hordes of cash stashed inside. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Wake him on it! Damn it. The cops are here! Let's go! Though the police would arrive a bit sooner than anticipated, Polly and Tommy would still manage to shoot their way out of the bank without losing the cash, and make it outside to steal a car and flee the scene with Tommy's considerable skills as a wheelman. Dodging the sight of nearly every LHPD officer the city could muster at the time, the two armed robbers would actually manage to escape and catch their breath at Sam's Club, with the two men now technically richer than their wildest dreams, and both with some form of plan to use the money to escape their tumultuous life of crime. sake. Sure. Ah! Oh. We gotta go. I'll see you tomorrow. Unless I'm halfway to Hawaii. Oh, come on. I'm kidding. Hey, I couldn't have done this without you. I know that. Go home, celebrate with Sarah, come by my place in the morning, we'll split up the dough. Yeah, okay. Good luck. See you around, pal. <laughs> Unfortunately for Polly, he and Tommy had drastically underestimated just how loyal Sam Trapani was, or at least, how loyal he wished to appear to be. With Tommy retiring to his home and planning to meet back up in the morning to divvy up the cash, they would both begin celebrating prematurely, and Tommy would even try to convince his wife Sarah to get out of town for a few days, ostensibly for a vacation, something she was immediately suspicious of, given Tommy's visible abundance of nerves. Well, look at this. Christ has finally risen. I was getting ready to call the coroner. Sorry. Had a bit of trouble falling asleep this off. Me too. Thanks to you tossing and turning all night. Okay, what'd you do? 
You're just feeling lucky, is all. Got that right, champ. But I've been thinking. Oh, yeah? I'll call the papers. I've been thinking about taking you and a kid out to the shore. You serious? Ain't you working? Uh, Polly and me, we've come into some money. Huh. One of his cracked angles finally pay off? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Pack a few bags. I'll swing by after I go around to Polly's. What ain't you telling me, Tommy? Nothing. Sure, you and Polly are suddenly flush, and now you want to leave town for a few days? That don't square. What's the point of making a buck if we can't spend it? That ain't it. You're moving. Even when you're standing still. Yeah, you're nervous about something. Probably you don't even know why yet. Well, that must be it. Well, you better figure it out before you get to Polly's. Just in case it's him that got you all wound up. <laughs> Polly's all right. Don't worry about it. Well, I guess I'll see you soon. When arriving at Polly's apartment as planned, Tommy would instead find his friend dead in his own home, murdered by an unknown party, likely the night before, and sending Tommy into a paranoid panic to find out what had really happened. Catching a phone call meant for Polly from Sam, he would learn that Don Salieri knew about their role in the Grand Imperial robbery, and as a result, Tommy would plead with Sam for help in getting himself and his family out of town as fast as possible, knowing that their days would be numbered just like Polly's if the Don really knew. Sam would agree to meet with Tommy at the city's art gallery, and in his panic, Tommy would hardly question the convenient timing of Sam's call, or even his willingness to seemingly betray the Don's trust by helping him out. Ah, Jesus. Polly. Slumped over in the hallway, torn a fucking skull. Oh God, I was, I was calling to warn him. About what? Jesus Christ! I owe you fellas my life three times over. Warn him about what, Sam? Salieri. He found out about the bank job. You're in deep shit, Tom. You gotta disappear. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I, I just need some cash to get me and the girls out of town. Can you swing that? Sure. Anything, pal. You want me to come to Polly's? No. No, I can't stay here. Uh, meet me at the, the city gallery. Yeah, okay. Keep your head down, Tom. I'll uh, see you soon. And uh, thanks, Sam. I always pay my debts, son. You know that. Arriving at the gallery to meet with Sam, Tommy would be confronted instead by several armed thugs, and soon after forced to come to terms with the reality that Sam himself had betrayed both him and Polly to Don Salieri, having lied about his silence when hearing Polly pitch the idea a month earlier. 
about to be promoted, likely to be underboss of the Salieri family, and having taken the considerable payout from Tommy and Polly's robbery, Sam would be more than pleased with himself for his own ambition, and despite showing a surface-level reluctance to kill yet another of his supposed friends, order his men to kill Tommy where he stood. Don't move, Tommy. Shit. Hey, Tom. Sam. What the hell's going on? You and Polly. You put me in a bad spot. I know, Sam, but I'm sorry about that, but I need to get out of town. Can you help me or not? There you go again. Making me choose between my friends and the family. This is what you were looking for at Polly's. Here's your cut. It's more than you deserve. Sam. You killed him. You killed Polly. No. Polly got himself killed. And you seem real tore off about it. I'm just in a good mood. Things are right between me and the Don. I'm moving up, and I just found this big bag of money. The Don knows about Frank, Tom. The whore, too. That whore? The girl you were sweet on? You're the one that let her live. Sorry about this, Tom. But our business has rules. Shame, too. Don Salieri really liked you. Guess we'll both have a good cry at your funeral. You think you're doing this because you're loyal, but you're not. You're just scared. Maybe. But you would've lived a lot longer if you would've just looked over your shoulder from time to time. Goodbye. Don't let him suffer, boys. He's my buddy. Unfortunately for Sam, he would drastically underestimate just how much better of a gunman Tommy was than anyone in his crew of soldiers paid for by drug money. Tommy would push his way through every single one of Sam's men and eventually catch up to Trapani on the gallery's upper levels, where Tommy managed to score several lucky shots and slow Sam down considerably. <laughs> lucky shot, Tom! But the thing about drug money is it pays for a lot of muscle. Put him down, boys! Eventually, Tommy would cut Sam down, leaving him bleeding in the gallery atrium, as he begged for his own life and revealed the extent to which Salieri had been aware of Tommy's increasing disillusionment with his criminal lifestyle. Nobody's carrying you to the doctor this time, Sam. You kill me now in the dawn. She's never gonna stop looking for you. But you let me live. I'll tell Salieri you're dead. You can disappear. Just like Frank. Only you'll be smart enough to stay gone. Right? What happened to him? He was hiding out in Europe. What <laughs> the dumb bastard. He started betting at the dog track. Got spotted by a friend of the family. So Salieri, he sent out a crew. And his family? Can't do 
it, can you? you? Always that little voice in the back of your head. Maybe sounds like your baby girl, or Sarah. Always telling you not to pull that trigger. And you can't make up your mind. It's getting easier every time you open your fucking mouth. <laughs> we sure had some laughs, right? Remember that time? Me, you, and Polly. When Unable to stomach one more word of deception from Sam, Tommy would ultimately pull the trigger on his friend and kill him where he lay, fleeing the gallery and soon after looking into whatever means necessary to keep his family safe from the inevitable retributions from Don Salieri. Tommy would eventually make a deal with LHPD detective John Norman to hear him out and meet up at a diner with plans to disclose everything he'd been a part of in Salieri's crew over the course of the last decade. After telling Norman his story, and eventually revealing that it had been him who killed Don Morello, a case Detective Norman had been working for several years at that point, Tommy would ultimately agree to testify against the entire Salieri organization, in exchange for he and his family being given new identities and new lives in a different city, and, most importantly, serving eight years in prison for his own crimes. After serving his time and helping to ensure the likes of Don Salieri and all of his former friends in the Salieri crew also did theirs, Tommy would be released from prison and finally be allowed to rejoin his family, including his wife Sarah, in the city of Empire Bay, where at least for five years they enjoyed relative peace in isolation. Having changed considerably since his days as a mere cabbie in Lost Heaven, Tommy would, by 1951, manage to settle into domestic life with Sarah, and even get to see his daughter's wedding sometime that year, just before his past finally caught up with him. Likely fully expecting the outcome, Thomas Angelo would be approached by Vito Scaletta and Joe Barbaro sometime in 1951, and, in retribution for taking down his former boss, be shot to death in front of his own home, with the same weapon he'd spared Frank Coletti from more than a decade earlier. Believing that ultimately his sacrifices had kept his family safe, Thomas Angelo would die happily surrounded by the people he had loved most in the world. A long time ago, in another life, someone once told me that family is a man's Achilles heel, his greatest weakness. Maybe he was right. Because everything I've done, both good and bad, I've done for my family. I've turned my back on people they thought were my friends. I've kept a lot of hard promises. I spent eight years totally alone, trying to find myself so I could come home. A better husband, a better father, a better man. Now that I'm a lot older and just a bit wiser, <laughs> I see that family is our greatest weakness, but it's also our greatest strength. gets us out of bed in the morning. But lets us chase our dreams, even when they're moving too fast to catch. And it keeps us from falling over when we're too tired to take another step. Mr. Angelo. Yes. 
Mr. Salieri sends his regards. Tommy! It's okay. You're safe now. You're all safe. Remember that money, jobs, even best pals will come and go. But family, family is forever. Thomas Angelo was a particularly unique individual as far as typical Prohibition-era mobsters went. Though he spent most of his early life living a relatively normal and non-violent existence, he was quite easily tempted by the allures of criminal life when seeing the wealth and power those within it could obtain, and more importantly, the potential for retributions that this power often brought. He was not originally a particularly violent man, but when given the opportunity, demonstrated a keen aptitude for murder, intimidation, and even street brawling, while maintaining a focus on the results of his actions, rather than what those actions said about him to the people around him. Tommy was, perhaps uncommonly for a mafioso, especially protective of individuals who from his perspective lived outside of the criminal life he participated in, risking his own life on numerous occasions to try and save innocent bystanders, and showing a great deal of distress and self-reflection when unable to do so effectively. Despite this streak of kindness for the criminally uninvolved, Tommy was also among the most ruthless and deadly gangsters seen in Lost Heaven during this era, and arguably anywhere in the United States at the time. He was responsible for killing numerous police officers and other gangsters over the course of his career, and seemed to show little, if any, hesitation when murdering those who were actively targeting him, or threatening those he cared about. Tommy did seem to have a streak of ego within him though, one that was comparably tame when contrasted with some of his far more hot-headed and legacy-driven friends or enemies. He ultimately joined the Salieri crew entirely to bolster his own ability to stay alive, and took an active role in joining by directly asking for permission to take revenge on the men who'd attacked him. Tommy was also, at least during some periods in his life, a heavy alcoholic though by most accounts he rarely actually allowed it to spill into his professional work as a gangster, and was inadvertently pushed off of this habit by the fears his boss had of a potential criminal miscalculation on the field. He also tended to play fast and loose with the laws of his day, even before joining the Salieri crew, having no issue with speeding or driving recklessly to get his fares to their destinations, or destroying the property of those who had done him wrong, such as the Morello goons who roughed up his taxi. Tommy was an expert marksman by most accounts, though it appears as if this skill was almost entirely natural, as he had little to no training with actual firearms prior to becoming a gangster. He was also a considerably talented driver, as shown by his many adept escapes for the mob, and his winning of the 1932 race against professionals, though this skill is far more easier to explain with his many years as a taxi driver. Regardless of how ruthless he was capable of being, Tommy was ultimately motivated and driven primarily by a genuine attachment to his loved ones and his friends, as demonstrated by his tendency to put his own life at risk to save them on more than one occasion, without even a second thought. While he may have sympathized with individuals less fortunate than himself and attempted to avoid killing the innocent wherever possible, he ultimately valued his family and friendships above all else, and rarely attempted to evaluate the morality of his situation unless directly prompted by excessive violence, either of his own making or those around him. Despite being a killer, a thief, and an all-around violent gangster, Tommy Angelo was very much capable of empathy, and this likely played an enormous role in how his life ultimately ended with Tommy unable to continue stomaching the daily horrors of mob life after nearly 10 years working for Salieri's crew, and valuing his actual family's safety above any sense of duty to the family or loyalty to those like Don Salieri. At the end of the day, Tommy Angelo was perhaps an example of just how tempting a sense of stability could be during the height of America's Great Depression, and how destructive the criminal lifestyle could be to those otherwise raised outside of its violent and utilitarian influence. Even when considering the less than justified murders that Tommy himself participated in, unlike many criminals of his status, he seemed to always have a sense of right and wrong independent of what his crime outfit dictated, 
and ultimately was prepared to spend almost a decade in prison for the consequences of his actions, and even face his death without a word of protest, knowing that he'd brought it upon himself. Tommy Angelo operated as a gangster in and around the city of Lost Heaven for nearly 10 years, but even in that relatively short period of time for someone in his lifestyle, managed to accrue more potential criminal charges than the average criminal can muster in their entire lifetimes. Though Tommy would eventually serve eight years in prison for his various crimes, it is our contention here at a criminal history that had all other circumstances been ignored, and his full record been used to determine his sentence, he likely would have remained in prison until the day he died. Through consultation with Detective John Norman and a review of various cases in the Lost Heaven Courier for confirmation, we have been able to complete what we believe to be a relatively accurate summary of all of his known crimes, though we must emphasize the use of the word known, as we can never be certain of just how many crimes he may have committed that went unreported due to his connections with the Salieri family and their ability to often avoid serious prosecution. That being said, let's examine what crimes we believe we can confirm, starting with Reckless endangerment when driving erratically around the city for Polly and Sam to avoid the attacking Morello soldiers when first meeting the Salieri crew. Assault, Grand Theft Auto, and destruction of private property when attacking the Morello goons with Polly who damaged his cab, setting fire to multiple vehicles, and stealing Dino's Schubert 6 motor car. Racketeering, accessory to racketeering, destruction of private property, and murder when performing collections for the Salieri crew in 1930 and killing several Morello thugs in order to save Sam Trapani and retrieve a substantial sum of cash. Grand Theft Auto, reckless endangerment, and sabotage when stealing a race car to deliver to Lucas Bertoni for modification, and driving the damaged car back to the racetrack to help rig the outcome. Assault when attacking several hoodlums harassing his future wife Sarah Marino in 1932. Assault, murder, accessory Grand Theft Auto, reckless endangerment, accessory murder, and accessory attempted murder when tracking down the hoodlums who were harassing Sarah and killing several of them, including Billy Galati, as well as stealing a car to pursue them when they fled the scene. Murder, intimidation or threats, destruction of private property, accessory murder, evading arrest, and reckless endangerment when attacking Morello goons at the Corleone Hotel, threatening a prostitute named Michelle, setting up dynamite inside the building, killing several police officers to escape, engaging in a massive shootout in St. Michael's Church, and killing even more police officers as he and Sam Trapani fled the scene. Accessory to buying illegal alcohol, murder, accessory murder, and evading arrest when killing numerous rival gangsters and police officers at a botched whiskey deal at a farm north of Lost Heaven. Murder, intimidation and threats, trespassing on government property, and arson when tracking down Frank Coletti to Lost Heaven International, and possibly shooting his way through numerous guards to reach Coletti. Murder, trespassing on private property, theft, grand theft auto, and evading arrest when breaking into a prosecutor's mansion to steal evidence of his murder of Billy Galati, and killing several gangsters and police officers in order to escape afterwards. Accessory to buying illegal alcohol, murder, accessory murder, destruction of government property, and reckless endangerment when engaging in a whiskey deal at a parking garage and shooting his way out of the building with Sam and Polly to deliver the booze to Salieri's warehouse. Murder, attempted murder, and accessory murder when killing all of the assassins who ambush him and Don Salieri at Pepe's restaurant, as well as nearly killing Carlo before Don Salieri finished the job personally. Accessory assault, murder, trespassing on private property, and murder of a public official when stealing a uniform from an incapacitated crewman in order to sneak aboard Councillor Roberto Galati's steamboat, where he murdered both the Councillor and several bodyguards in order to escape. Murder, reckless endangerment, destruction of private property, and arson when murdering Sergio Morello's wife and later chasing down Sergio to a warehouse at the Lost Heaven Harbor, killing numerous Morello soldiers in the process and destroying the warehouse to finish Sergio off. Accessory murder, evading arrest, reckless endangerment, murder, grand theft auto, and destruction of private property when chasing down Marco Morello after a charity gala, killing numerous Morello soldiers, stealing a car, and shooting down Morello's plane before finally catching the mob boss and personally finishing him off. Murder of a public official, murder, evading arrest, and reckless endangerment when assassinating gubernatorial candidate Hank Turnbull and subsequently shooting his way through dozens of pursuing LHPD officers in order to escape. 
trespassing on private property, accessory murder, murder, grand theft auto, and evading arrest when stealing a customs truck to sneak into the Lost Heavens customs impound, killing or incapacitating several guards, stealing a shipment of impounded cigars, allegedly containing smuggled diamonds, and escaping the pursuing LHPD forces with Sam and Polly. Armed robbery, murder, evading arrest, and Grand Theft Auto when robbing the Grand Imperial Bank on Central Island alongside Polly, killing several guards in the vault, and even killing more police officers when escaping the bank and fleeing the scene. Murder when fighting back against numerous soldiers hired by Sam Trapani when surviving his assassination attempt, as well as murdering Sam himself. As you can see, regardless of how rosy one views the life and crimes of Thomas Angelo, there can be little doubt that he was among the most violent and effective gangsters in the state of Illinois, and possibly even in the entire United States during the 1930s. Had his sentencing accounted for every crime we believe he was responsible for, or had he not been willing to make a deal with Detective John Norman, it seems more than likely that Tommy would have received multiple life sentences for his body count alone, without even considering his numerous other crimes. While we cannot say if Tommy's actions later in life offered any sort of redemption for the various acts of appalling violence he participated in, we can say that at least among traditional Mafia gangsters, there were few people in his time who could ever hold a candle to his overwhelming effectiveness as a mobster and a criminal. Before we sign off tonight, Behringer's department store has urged us to remind you, dear listener, that America can be quite a dangerous place, and that no one should take this danger for granted. We would like to thank our wonderful sponsors over at Swift Cola for providing our team with access to numerous documents, interviews, and even reputable individuals to help in our investigations, as well as, of course, the amazing Behringer's department store itself, with six floors of amazing deals. Why go anywhere else? Serving the city of Lost Heaven for nearly 90 years. Hey guys, Normal Guinness here. Thank you so much for tuning in to the first episode of A Criminal History not directly focused on the Grand Theft Auto franchise. I hope you've enjoyed this initial departure, as from now on I will be attempting to showcase characters from numerous games, and eventually even movies, while maintaining that criminal history stylized presentation. If you can afford it, and you enjoy this channel regularly, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help keep these episodes a regular occurrence. And don't forget to check out the work of my executive producer tier patrons, because without them, and really, all my patrons, this show would simply not be possible. I'll see you next time for another exciting edition of A Criminal History for a special Halloween episode. And until then, I'm your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you so much for watching.